B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Wednesday, March 6, 2019. The Democratic Party is operating in a shameful manner. As leaders in the House have postponed a vote to censure Congresswoman Ilan Omar for anti-Semitic comments that she has never made. And I'm glad to see that in a caucus meeting on Tuesday night that was described as fiery at times, a brawl in other accounts, that some Democrats stood up and opposed Nancy Pelosi's plan to publish and uh, pass in the House a resolution which is uh, thinly veiled, and I am trying to connect thinly veiled with the headscarf that Ilan Omar wears. But it is a thinly veiled effort to tell her to sit down and shut up. Because the special relationship with the state of Israel and its allies with AIPAC and the array of pro-Israel organizations across this country have demanded this action, and the slavish Democratic leadership is falling in line. So in a closed-door session, Democrats protested the plans to vote this week on a resolution. And as of today, Wednesday, the number two in the House, Steny Hoyer, has said there may not be a vote this week. We are discussing what is the best way to address it. And we're told that the one-sided resolution which denounces anti-Semitism, has been amended to include some equivalent denunciation of Islamophobic comments. And Nancy Pelosi here, I think, is uh, treading on thin ice. And I believe that she is carrying water for the Friends of Israel. Quote from Pelosi, you can disagree wholeheartedly, but do not question their patriotism or their loyalty to our country in any way. And that holds for the Republicans as well. And that was a reference to questioning the motivations of our colleagues. And I'm sorry. I've known Nancy Pelosi since the 1980s. I worked on her campaign some 23 years ago. Got to know her fairly well, and I respect her as an individual. And I respect her achievements as speaker and speaker again. But Pelosi trying to tamp this down, saying that this is an effort to divide us by the media and to divert attention from our agenda. They're trying to pass this uh, House Bill 1, which is a catch-all of great ideas about fixing our election process and it doesn't have a snowball's chance in hell of becoming law. I do understand it's important to set the agenda to show what Democrats stand for. But this is not just an inconvenient moment. This is a significant moment. And Democrats need to stand up for and stand up behind Ilan Omar. She is being smeared unfairly. And Democrats have led the charge, talking about her vile, anti-Semitic comments. And last night, on the public television news hour, they did it again, acting like state media in the headline section, where it's understandable they don't go into great detail. They spent about 40 seconds reporting on the smear of Congresswoman Omar, and they did say that she is being accused of potentially anti-Semitic remarks. Now, what what the hell does that mean? And so PBS essentially reported the smear, tried to soften it a little bit, but didn't offer the viewers any understanding of the context or what she actually said. This is media malpractice. This is demagoguery. And when it's driven by the so-called political left... It just leaves us dispirited. I left the Democratic Party in 1998. And I understand why actions like this will lead others to do the same. What does the party stand for? (laughs) In this case, it stands for loyalty to Israel. Loyalty to AIPAC. 
doesn't have anything to do with people who are Jewish. But that's how it's being intentionally misconstrued in an effort to silence an important voice at this particular moment in time. So many members uh, stood up. We don't have their names. They challenged the decision to move forward with a resolution condemning religious hatred. Initially, the measure targeted only anti-Semitism, with some Democrats pushing for a direct rebuke of Omar. But by Tuesday night, facing backlash from members not on board with the plan, leaders decided to expand it to include an anti-Muslim bias. And some people are just annoyed that this is happening at all. Bonnie Watson, a Democratic representative from New Jersey, said, why are we doing this? Any resolution would be redundant and unnecessary. We've individually and collectively already responded to the fact we oppose all isms that do not treat people in this country fairly and justly. To continue to engage this discussion is simply an opportunity to give both, both the media and Republicans distractions from our agenda. Well, uh, with all due respect, I think this is more important. Then the agenda, which uh, I have pointed out, is valuable. It's an important set of statements, but it has no hope of passage. And I believe we need to deal with this right now. Omar needs to be able to speak respectfully and critically of our politics that align with the state of Israel and its extreme Likud government. And here comes Ted Deutsch. Uh, Jewish congressman from Florida. He grew emotional. He said his colleagues needed to understand that these sort of words were hurtful to people like himself who dealt with them all their lives. Well, Ted, man up, will you? She did not criticize you as a Jew. She criticized people who demand that she support Israel as a condition of service on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And there is a clear effort to get her bounced from that committee. Here's Liz Cheney, the voice <laughs> of, of love and understanding. They should stop empowering her disgusting hatred before it turns into horror, said Liz Cheney, a horror in, a, in, her, in her own right who spews hatred as often as she possibly can. And I believe that this is a defining moment and a defining issue for the Democratic Party. And I recognize some of this is old guard versus young, aggressive new members. But it is also defined by the money that flows from those who are aligned with APAC. And that is not a secret in Washington. And the idea that we can all be silenced and, you know, we'll just ignore it, it'll go away is absurd and insulting. Here's a statement from Charles Chamberlain, yeah, Chamberlain, Chair of Democracy for America. While Democrats oppose anti-Semitism, everyone paying attention knows that the particular resolution is being pushed right now, not to hold Republicans accountable for the countless times they have stood silently as the president whitewashed neo-Nazis, but instead to tell a newly elected black Muslim refugee congresswoman to sit down and shut up. And over the weekend, in West Virginia, at the House of Delegates, there was a poster outside the chamber with a picture of Congresswoman Omar connecting her to the September 11th events. And these kinds of smears that are based on race and religion have to be fully repudiated by the Democratic Party. Israel does not need any more defense they, they defend themselves very well. And as I said, American Jews have not been attacked, but they believe because of what Democratic people and, uh, I mean, Democratic leaders and others have mischaracterized the comments and the intentions of Omar. And The Intercept reports that Trump retweeted a tweet related to a letter that comes from a far-right uh, group of anti-Muslim activists in this country, mostly aligned with the Republican right. And their <laughs> not-secret demand 
is that uh, they want Ilan Omar removed from the Foreign Affairs Committee because they have decided that she is anti-Semitic. And this is a, a frightening development where we see the right wing operating in a hateful manner, targeting individuals who they believe oppose their agenda, and then we have Democrats piling on and helping them do this dirty work. Glenn Greenwald, also at The Intercept, goes deep. I've linked to his commentary in the show file for today's podcast, and he makes a number of good points. He says, you know, this could be five or six different articles, and he proceeded to put them all into one package here. But he points out that it was Jonathan Chait at New York Magazine who started this whole little brush fire with an article headlined, Ilan Omar accuses Israel hawks of allegiance to a foreign country. Now, she never said that. She said that she doesn't want to be expected to have allegiance to support a foreign country in order to serve in Congress or on the committee. And so these words of her own have been, as we hear lately, weaponized and turned against her. And I give her a lot of credit for standing firm. Reportedly, she made no comments at the Democratic caucus on Tuesday evening. Greenwald continues, it's beyond dispute that what Omar is saying is true, given that the very, very first bill passed by the U.S. Senate this year was one allowing punishment for American citizens who boycott Israel, while U.S. citizens in 26 states are formally punished for boycotting this foreign nation. We're allowed to boycott other states, you know, like North Carolina over its bathroom regulations. But he points out that some in America demand allegiance to a foreign nation when American citizens are allowed to boycott American states but are punished for boycotting this one specific foreign nation. This is clearly favoritism and a selective interpretation of our free speech rights in this country. And Greenwald reprints a, a section from a New York Times commentary in 2015 when Benjamin Netanyahu came and spoke to a joint session of Congress, and the, they talk about how 49 of them stood him up. They refused to attend the session. It represents an unprecedented rebellion, all the more striking, because allegiance to Israel has long had nearly unanimous support in Congress. So the New York Times can describe the widespread allegiance to Israel of members of Congress. But Ilan Omar cannot protest that pressure is being put on her to fall into line. Later, Greenwald says, The most important point regarding the Democrat resolution to rebuke Omar is this. It includes a long list of comments which it denounces as anti-Semitic, many, if not most of which, are indeed anti-Semitic, which Ilan Omar never said or even implied. That's the fraud at the heart of what Democrats are doing. They're purporting to, purporting to denounce Omar by enacting a resolution that condemns a series of comments about Jews that she never uttered. And then he goes through the litany of what is in the resolution and follows up with, she never accused Jews of having allegiance to Israel. She never remotely insinuated that Jews are not or cannot be patriotic Americans. She never blamed Jews for anything. The irony here is glaring. What is actually bigoted, the real bigots, are those who are exploiting Omar's status as a black Muslim and Somali immigrant to link her to a series of anti-Semitic statements that she has never expressed and that have nothing whatsoever to do with the critiques she has voiced about U.S.-Israel policy since entering Congress. All of this is being accomplished by a deceitful sleight of hand that conflates the Israeli government and its American supporters with Jews. Again, a group that Omar has never criticized. What's actually anti-Semitic is to conflate the Israel government and those who support it with Jews. That's something being done by Democratic House leaders, not by Congresswoman Omar. And then he says that many Jews are critics of the state of Israel, and many supporters of Israel aren't Jews. They are evangelical Christians. 
So it is completely dishonest. Greenwald continues. In fact, defamatory and offensive to suggest that Omar was speaking of Jews when she denounced those who are supporters of Israel and who demand that she and other U.S. lawmakers prioritize this foreign nation above the interests of their own constituents. So Greenwald, right on, and I. Identify Glenn as culturally Jewish. I don't know if he considers himself to be practicing, but、uh, he makes some excellent and very strong statements here. Also, I am linking to and I recommend Caitlin Johnstone's commentary. She is from Australia and has some of the best focused views on the American political scene. Her headline is priceless: Israel lobby rebuts Omar's claims about its immense influence by exerting. Its immense influence, <laughs> and she even cites some of Greenwald's comments on this. She also quotes,、uh, as I did yesterday, California Democratic Congressman Juan Vargas, Vargas, I'm sorry, who criticized Omar and then added, "Questioning support for the U.S.-Israel relationship is unacceptable. No, sir, your intolerance is what's unacceptable, and the idea that Israel is so special." That we're not allowed to have opinions, we're not allowed to express criticism, is deeply, deeply offensive, and it's just plain wrong. Another quote from John Stone here: "This bogus concern trolling about anti-Semitism has always been about smearing, and the smearing has always been about narrative control. If they can manipulate the public into distrusting someone who voices a dissenting narrative, they can keep that dissenting narrative from entering the bloodstream." Of mainstream consciousness, the social engineers are not interested in fighting religious bigotry; they are interested in shutting her up. But I have to tell you that so far, the most surprising critical commentary that I've read is from a man I've known for over ten years. He's a Routine columnist on the opinion page of the Washington Post. He came out of Media Matters. His name is Paul Waldman. And just a few months ago, I reached out to Paul because he'd written a pro Russia Gate story, and I wanted to、uh, mix it up with him and invited him to be a guest on the podcast. And he declined、uh, based on scheduling issues that I think were just a pretext. So, with that said, Paul Waldman is an establishment Democrat, and for him to open up his column with a criticism of the speaker is truly remarkable. Quote. In what is surely the most shameful decision of her current term as Speaker, Nancy Pelosi has decided the time has come for the House to rebuke Ilan Omar for things she didn't actually say and ideas she didn't actually express. In the process, Pelosi and other Dems are helping propagate a series of misconceptions about anti-Semitism, Israel, and U.S. political debate. Well, Paul Waldman, I respect your voice on this, and he identifies. Quote. I do this as someone who was raised in an intensely Zionist family with a long history of devotion and sacrifice for Israel, but who also, like many American Jews, has become increasingly dismayed not only by developments in Israel but by how we talk about it here in the United States. And he recaps what occurred, and he says that、uh, for many years Jews were routinely accused of having dual loyalty to both the United States and Israel, as a way of questioning whether they were truly American and could be trusted. That charge was anti-Semitic because it was used to allege that every Jew was suspect. But now, well, here's the truth about Omar: the whole purpose of the Democrats' resolution is to enforce dual loyalty, not among Jews, but among members of Congress, to make sure the criticism of Israel is punished in the most visible way possible. As it happens, this punishment of criticism of Israel is exactly what the freshman congresswoman was complaining about, and has on multiple occasions. The fact that no one seems to acknowledge that this is her complaint shows how spectacularly disingenuous Omar's critics are being. There, there's much more here, and I, I don't want to just read the entire column to you, but I encourage you to follow the link to the Washington Post and、uh, check it out for yourself. As he closes, he says. When Omar says she shouldn't have to do the same,、uh, express, you know, regarding dual loyalty, everyone jumps up to accuse her of anti-Semitism. 
on the bogus grounds that she is secretly referring to Jews and not to what she's being asked to do, and that it's some kind of anti-Semitic smear to even raise the issue of people being asked to promise their allegiance to Israel when the truth is that members of Congress are asked to do just that. Paul Waldman, nicely done. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions, and we've got Terry Paris、uh, ten dollars on March fourth. We've got Terry Paris five dollars on March third.、Uh, Teresa Paris, I am very grateful. Brian Carey kicked in five dollars, and Louis Scolari just renewed his annual subscription. Thank you, Louis. I appreciate that support, and others can do it too. All you have to do is visit peterbcollins.com, click on the menu, then click on become a subscriber. You land on the sign up page, and yes, I've got bonus books. If you're a new annual subscriber with a mailing address in the continent, continental U.S., I can send you a copy of Justin Frank's Trump on the Couch. It is a great read. Well, I was、uh, mildly surprised in Sunday's New York Times to see one of the op-ed columnists depart from the party line at the Gray Lady, and Ross Douthat invoked a kind of rare moment of lucidity. He's talking about the end game of the Mueller investigation, and he asks, "Will Mueller prove essentially collusion?" While retaining an official agnosticism, my sense after Michael Cohen's testimony is that the odds are as low as they've been since this whole affair started, and the increasing likelihood is that the Steele dossier was, in fact, as Trump's defenders have long described it, a narrative primarily grounded in Russian disinformation. He says that the whole Trump Tower Moscow project. Seem to be kind of a joke. Instead of Putin offering Trump a sweetheart deal, it seems to have involved his fixers trying to get the Russian government's attention to no practical end. Then he says that the、uh, testimony of Cohen last week, that he overheard the speaker phone call from Roger Stone saying that WikiLeaks told him that Hillary Clinton's emails were coming. He said, "Well." <laughs> Stone was not exactly de- delivering privileged information because we all already knew that. Anyway, he he closes by saying, if the dossier's claim of a years-long Trump Kremlin entanglement and its claim of Cohen's direct involvement are both looking implausible or false, then its claims about a sustained Manafort-managed collaboration should be treated extremely skeptically as well. In which case, the most likely Lafair Russ. End game may be a special prosecutor's report that doesn't make Trump look good or decent or moral, but which implicitly exonerates him of, expi- of conspiring with the Russians. I believe that's what I've been saying for a couple of years now. Nice to see somebody at the Times break free of the Russia Gate、uh, bubble. Uh, also, based on Michael Cohen's testimony and the evidence that he has produced since last week, we now know that Trump personally signed six out of eight of the hush money checks that have surfaced so far.、Uh, Cohen is still trying to get the others uh, 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 copies of them from his bank. But the Times reports that、uh, by checking timelines, for example, the day the president hosted a foreign leader in the Oval Office, he wrote a check. He haggled over legislation. Then he wrote a check. He traveled abroad and wrote a check. On the same day, he reportedly pressured the FBI director to drop an investigation into Mike Flynn. The president's trust issued a check to Cohen in furtherance of what federal prosecutors have called a criminal scheme to violate campaign finance laws at the direction of Trump. And once again, we have clear evidence. That could form the basis of an impeachment investigation that should be launched forthwith, but no, the Democrats are blocking. Last night on PBS, there was another bad report spinning up Trump's border wall as a good thing. They sent a reporter to the border, I believe, it was in Arizona, and they interviewed only people who support the wall. And I'm sure there are people who live near the border who support a wall. But there was no balance whatsoever. <laughs> They didn't offer anything offsetting. And today, in the New York Times, we are learning that the latest data shows that all of Trump's efforts to signal to future 
immigrants to the United States. Do not come here. We'll separate you from your children. We'll lock you up indefinitely. We'll make you wait in Mexico if you ask for asylum. None of it is working. In fact, it is failing bigly. And while Trump's vision of invaders is bullshit, the number of people who are coming to our border and turning themselves in has reached a recent peak. 76,000 people、uh, crossed the border without authorization in February, and that is an 11 year high. Another big promise of Trump he was going to slash the U.S. trade deficit. Last year, we set an all time record $891 billion, the largest in our 243 year history. Are you tired of winning yet? Huh? Are you? The Democrats have introduced in both the House and the Senate a bill called the Save the Internet Act, intending to reverse the FCC decision last year to end net neutrality. And I fully support that, even though, once again, it's likely to be an agenda setting item and not a bill that actually becomes law. Yesterday, I shared with you the audio and a video package from an interview with Tim Redmond,、uh, who is a San Francisco based journalist, and Eric Thrasher, an activist. We talked about Pacific Gas and Electric, what I called the rogue utility. It's in bankruptcy again, and、uh, we support,、uh, me and my guests in the program, a, an effort to、uh, shift to public ownership of this troubled utility. Well, that got the interest of a listener who lives in San Luis Obispo, where the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant is, and we reference that as one of the sources of PG&E's efforts to stick the ratepayers with their cost overruns. And Henry, who lives just about 10 miles from the plant, he says, which is scheduled to be shut down in the next five years, he wrote with some very interesting statistics、um, about PG&E, and for example, And、because of the nuclear power plant, we've seen increased cancer rates,、uh, an additional 738 people who were diagnosed between 2001 and 2010. Cancer incidents rose from 0.4% to 6.9% above the average of the state of the California while the plant has been in operation. And Henry, I appreciate those、uh, data points that you shared with us. Also, I want to recommend a great article over at Who, What, Why today, and I didn't have anything to do with instigating this. It's under the byline of Glenn Dagan, who writes about the、uh, premature filing of bankruptcy that PG&E has used to try to shield some $60 billion in assets、uh, and prevent. Those who have been victimized by the reckless and uh, uh, negligent operation of the company、uh, through loss of property and life、uh, from the wildfires of the last couple of years. And there is a shareholder group, Blue Mountain Capital, which has hired Phil Angelides. He's a former state treasurer, state party chair of the Democrats, and、uh, ba- Barack Obama. Appointed him to investigate the Wall Street financial meltdown of 2008. He is、uh, trying to push for、uh, the shareholder point of view. We'll see if that dovetails with the ratepayer perspective, which is what I'm interested in. Well, it's not a surprise, but we now know that Fox News had the Stormy Daniels story before the 2016 election, and we're told that Sir Keith Rupert Murdoch himself. Said, oh no, we don't want to run that because、uh, we, <laughs> we want、uh, Trump to win. And this is linked to the New Yorker's Jane Mayer, who published a big story on Monday about the、uh, virtual merger between Trump and Fox News, the outsized influence with、uh, this guy Bill Shine, who is now the communications director at Trump's White House, who used to be the president of Fox News. He succeeded. Uh, the founder, Roger Ailes, and、uh, Mayer writes that a direct pipeline has been established between the Oval Office and Murdoch. Multiple sources told me that Murdoch and Trump often talk on the phone. Bill Shine、uh, collaborates with、uh, his counterparts, including a daily conversation that Trump has with、uh, good old Sean Hannity. Yeah, there's a lot of linkage there. And properly, the Democratic National Committee. 
and its chair, Tom Perez, have announced that Fox News will not be permitted to televise any of the presidential debates in the 2020 cycle. I think that is a very good decision. Also, John Zwiebel, our loyal listener in Hawaii, who is a big supporter of Tulsi Gabbard, is inviting you and me to each donate at least a dollar to her campaign, because for her to get into the presidential debates, she has to show sixty-five thousand donors, with a minimum of two hundred from each of twenty states. Now, I think that's an interesting way to establish a candidate's viability, and I agree with Zwiebel. That Tulsi has distinguished herself as the one voice who is completely opposed to U.S. meddling in Venezuela, and I certainly am intrigued to hear more about her.、Uh, I have some issues with her past opposition to abortion rights and、uh, other social issues, but I am prepared to be persuaded. So I'd like to see her on the debate stage, and John, I will donate a dollar、uh, just to、uh, advance her. Prospects there. Mike Bloomberg and、uh, Senator Jeff Merkley have announced they will not be running for president. I support the decision by each of those men. And、uh, Jeff Merkley is a two-term senator from Oregon, and he is wise not to give up his seat to run in such a crowded uh, uh, category. John Hickenlooper, the、uh, Hickenlooper, the two-term Colorado governor and former owner of a brew pub. Has entered the race as a、uh, Clinton-backed centrist, and、uh, you know a lot of people immediately start sniping when somebody enters the race. And I say, no, 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 let's just hear him out. Let the games begin, and the voters will decide. Stacey Abrams is、uh, trying to make a decision after coming close and having the election for governor of Georgia stolen from her by voter suppression schemes and other tactics. She is considering whether to run for the Senate from Georgia, to wait and run for governor again, or to run for president. And while I fully support her very liberal politics,、uh, I'm just not sure that、uh, she has the traction. To make a national race at this point, and one thing that came up over the weekend, Hillary Clinton spoke in Selma, Alabama, and she freely acknowledged that Stacey Abrams should be governor. She was deprived of votes they otherwise would have gotten through Republican suppression tactics, and I believe that Hillary even acknowledged that that played a role in her own loss. It only took a couple of years for her to admit that. Bernie Sanders made it personal. When he held the、uh, campaign launch rallies in Brooklyn and in Chicago over the weekend, he got huge crowds. And instead of just repeating his stump speech, he talked about himself. This is a new strategy. Now、uh, he does place limits on it because when he formally announced he was running for president, he went on TV. And he nixed a campaign launch video that had been produced for him, and three of his top advisers quit in protest. So Bernie is still the cranky old guy who insists on doing things his way, but he did take some advice to talk about himself. And the polls show that Sanders is gaining ground among African American voters. A recent poll shows that he is a close second to Joe Biden, who is not formally announced for president. Uh, and that he's doing better with young、uh, and low-income voters, where he is outpacing Kamala Harris with black voters、uh, by a two-to-one margin. So the race is shaping up in an interesting way. It's going to be a challenge to cover all these different candidates, but we're going to give it a go. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it everywhere. You'll find it on YouTube, and I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you. Until we meet again. Happy trails.